I, I praise him and thank him for pushing us along this route so that we could have Lafayette return uh, to the places he visited in 1824. So Peter will talk to us now, and the title of his talk, and he will correct me if I get it wrong, is Lafayette a superhero, and I think I added this, I don't know if he likes it, uh, the farewell tour in context. Peter, are you ready to go? Sure. Peter Rodgers. You know, I uh, noticed that there was that one toast, I think it was the last one, where they talked about Laf how we would uh, cherish Lafayette's, uh, I can't remember the word they used, but it meant his descendants, I think. His, uh, it started with a P. Posterity. Yeah, his posterity. And uh, in New York and in Boston, we had uh, Lafayette's uh, uh, eighth great granddaughter and her two and her two daughters at many of the events. Uh, we you know we have pictures, so we actually followed through on that promise. So I, I thought that they were, they were, they were, they were very very interesting uh, uh, group uh, group of people. Uh, so at any rate, actually I. The superhero is a giveaway because uh, I thought of the title as being Lafayette more than a rock star. Uh, but anyway, here goes. On July 25th, 1824, Salem Town Jr. of Charlton, Massachusetts wrote to his wife about the expected reception of Lafayette in Boston. There never was, nor will be, such a meeting, such a meeting in this or any country. Reflecting on the tour a few years later, Edward Everett wrote that it was an event taken in all its parts unparalleled in the history of man. Hezekiah Niles wrote, the volumes of history furnish no parallel. No one like Lafayette has ever reappeared in any country. Uh, I don't know, maybe somebody can come up with an example, but I, 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 I can't. I, I really do think it's like nothing else. Uh, every, uh, when word of Lafayette's upcoming visit came out, Mayor Quincy of Boston wrote to Lafayette inviting him to come to Boston. Lafayette responded, whatever port I first attain, I shall with the same eagerness hasten to Boston and present its beloved, revered inhabitants as I have the honor to offer it to the city council and to you, sir, with homage of my affectionate gratitude. He followed through on that promise, crossing the border between Rhode Island and Massachusetts on August 23rd, a week after he landed in Manhattan. He spent the night in Roxbury, and the next day was paraded to the State House. Mayor Quincy addressed him in, at the city line. Uh, Roxbury was not part of Boston in uh, 1824. When urged by generous sympathy, you first landed on these shores, you found the people engaged in an arduous and eventful struggle for liberty with apparently inadequate means and amidst dubious omens. After the lapse of nearly half a century, you find the same people, prosperous beyond all hope and all precedent, their liberty secure, sitting in its strength, without fear and without reproach. In your youth, you joined the standard of three millions of people raised in an unequal and uncertain conflict. In your advanced age, you return and are met by 10 millions of people, their descendants, whose hearts throng hither to greet your approach and to rejoice in it. This is not the movement of a turbulent, turbulent populace excited by fresh laurels of some recent conqueror. It is a grave, moral, intellectual impulse. Now it's worth pausing here a moment to consider what the state of the world might have appeared to someone involved in the celebration of Lafayette. This would be somebody who reads the newspapers. Uh, consider the far news section of the recorder in Greenfield, Mass. on um, August 17, 1824. So on August 17, 1824, we get a summary of what the New York papers have printed from the English and French papers up to June 26th. Uh, information moved 
as fast as people move. Uh, go ahead. Uh, right. Uh, that's uh, Ferdinand VII there, uh, King of Spain. Uh, he's a constitutional monarch, more or less thanks to Napoleon, I guess, I guess you might say, kind of. Uh, and he doesn't want to be a constitutional monarch anymore. He wants to be an absolute monarch. And uh, uh, the King of France, uh, Louis XVIII, is backing him uh, in that. Um, there's a report, uh, there was a report that one of the independent governments of South America is seeking to buy vessels of war in order that they might place their navy on an equal footing with Spain. In Spain itself, a decree, a decree of amnesty appears to be mere mockery. More French troops were pouring into the country. And, because he's got the backing to, he, he wants to be an absolute monarch. <laughs> uh, next. There, there are stories from the, about the fighting for Greek independence. Lord Byron, who had been using his financial resources to aid the revolution against the Ottomans, had died there in April. Uh, go ahead. Uh, an 18-year-old lad in Newburyport would stand in the pouring rain on August 31st, waiting to shake hands with Lafayette. Pondering his career choices, he wavered between trying to get into West Point or in following Lord Byron's example and fight for the liberty of Greece. Instead, William Lloyd Garrison would found a newspaper called The Liberator in 1831 and help found the American Anti-Slavery Society. Uh, to understand the full context of Lafayette's life, you would have to have deeper knowledge of American, French, and general European history than I could ever hope for. But here is how I will sum it up. Lafayette was close to universally popular in the United States. In Europe, not so much. Here is an example of someone who did not like Lafayette. Uh, uh, Cla uh, Clemens von Metternich was going to make the world safe for absolute monarchy. Uh, Henry Kissinger is a great admirer of his. Uh, and I think Henry's still alive, right? Yeah. <laughs> Um, so, uh, at, at, any, at any rate, um, when uh, Lafayette uh, died, uh, excuse me, Sarah, uh, uh, on, in 1834, uh, Metternich wrote in his diary, Lafayette is dead, too late for the world. I am disgusted to see the Monitor pronounces a eulogy over him. Um, and. Uh, Actually, Metternich referred to the Monroe Doctrine as an indecent declaration. Uh, there is also news that Lafayette would be taking passage to the United States on July 10th. And elsewhere in the paper, notice that, the La that Lafayette had renounced the designation of Marquis. And that wasn't exactly news, I guess, but um, they noticed that people were re still referring him to as Marquis, and uh, they wanted to. Uh, uh, let everybody know that he should be just referred to as general, that's his preference. And in the newspaper accounts and the speeches, uh, that was pretty consistently held in 1824 and 1825. Now, so well-informed Americans would be aware of the perilous state of government by the people in the world, but as Sarah Val wrote, uh, more than anyone on earth, Lafayette was mournfully aware of the uniqueness of the American re Republic he had fought to build. It's, you know, it's really the only game in town with this government of the people stuff. Uh, so, the image that people might have had in their minds of uh, Lafayette, you know, is the young dashing marquis, 19 years old, major, uh, major general, but that's not what they got. Uh, the general, the general, he consistently wore civilian clothes, and he was quite a bit older and stouter. Uh, but he meets with this tremendous positive reception. And uh, go ahead. So Lafayette enthusiasts like to say he was he was a rock star. Uh, and we've got a T-shirt which is available on Lafayette200.org store. You can buy the t-shirt, and it shows Lafayette there with the 
electric guitar, and a very partial list of the cities that were part of the tour. Uh, now, there are two problems with the rock star metaphor. The first is that when Lafayette arrives, he didn't put on a show for the community. Uh, and in, in some ways, we modify that a bit to teach people about Lafayette. But when he, when he, actually, uh, when he actually came, the community put on, put on a show for Lafayette. Lafayette wasn't putting on a show for them. He just had to show up, okay? The, uh, after the big speech from the most eminent person available, he said a few words of thanks, shook hands, and reminisced with the veterans whom he invariably remembered, kissed the ladies on the hand, and told the militia that he had not seen finer troops anywhere. <laughs> Um, and he just, he just had to show up. Um, and the, the second problem is that Rockstar is inadequate. Lynn, Massachusetts on August 31st, 1824, captures the high esteem from Lafayette in the speech of Jonathan White, Chairman of Committee of Arrangements. Uh, Alan said his favorite speech is the one that we did uh, uh, today of, uh, is the, uh, selectman Ham, that, but this is kind of my favorite, it's the most poetic. Although your present appearance among us, like the transit of a brilliant and beneficent planet commissioned to profane goodwill to men, man, in its rapid career among innumerable worlds, is short and fleeting. The emanations of the bright and joyous light which is shed around you will continue with us to guide our steps and cheer our hearts to the latest moment of our existence. The banner in Lynn that day went even further. Thou gavest us 13 ta talents. Lo, we have gained 11 more. Receive <laughs> our gratitude. Uh, it's, it's just over the top. Uh, Salem had one of the most distinguished speakers um, of uh, that day, uh, Joseph Story had been on the United States Supreme Court since 1811. In 1841, he would write the opinion in United States versus Amistad, which would free 53 Africans who rose up to take over the ship that they were be being illegally transported in. He summarized Lafayette's contribution in this way. Can we forget that we were poor and struggling, alone in a doubtful contest for independence, and you cross the Atlantic at hazard of fortune and fame to cheer us in our resistance. That you recrossed it to solicit naval and military succors from the throne of France and returned with triumphant success. That your gallantry in the Southern campaign checked the inroads of a brave and confident enemy. That your military labors closed but the, with the surrender at Yorktown and thus indissolubly united your name with the proud events of that glorious day. Lafayette was not a rock star, he was a superhero. <laughs> <laughs> and like every superhero, he has an origin story. Um, next, yeah, so, okay. Um, now I draw, I draw, I draw heavily on uh, *Hero of Two Worlds* by uh, Mike Duncan in the uh, origin story. Although uh, I have a problem, I read, I read multiple biographies, and I can't remember which what I got from which one. But, uh, it, so, at any rate, uh, okay. Uh, Marie Joseph Paul Yves Roche Gilbert de Mathier de Lafayette was born in 1757. As a youngster, he went by Gilbert. He spent his early years in Chavanagh, far from the center of power in Versailles and Paris. Since my, I am terrible at French pronunciation, and this is a superhero narrative inspired by a true story, we will call it Smallville. <laughs> his father died in the Battle of Minden in 1759, uh, making uh, Gilbert the Marquis. His father's family, relatively poor sword nobles, had a long tradition of fighting and frequently dying for the king, going back at least as far as jo Joan of Arc. Uh, 
Gilbert's mother, Marie Louise Jolene de la Riviere, left him with his paternal grandmother and aunts. Uh, her family was uh, more prestigious. Uh, and so she, she lived in Paris. And basically, she lost her husband. She's got the uh, two-year-old kid. Uh, she lived in, with the paternal grandmother and some aunts and goes to Paris uh, to live with her grandfather and she's going to be paving his way. Uh, living in what we might call metropolis with her grandfather, she was paving the way for Gilbert's future. Gilbert was happy being the young lord of the manor that his grandmother managed. He took his military heritage to heart. Later in life, he remarked, I can recall no time in my life when I did not love stories of glorious deeds or have dreams of traveling the world in search of fame. Uh, he felt responsibility to protect his people. The general region was being terrorized by a mysterious animal whose exact nature is still uncertain. Eight-year-old Gilbert spent many hours in the woods hunting for the beast of Gogodon. Uh, we can all be thankful that he never found it. Uh, <laughs> the beast was, they killed something uh, <laughs> uh, not too long after. They, they never quite figured out exactly what it was. Uh, so, at any rate, in 1768, Gilbert got the summons to go to Paris, and his carefree life as little lord of the manor was over. In Paris, not adapted to court life, and still dreaming of an active military career, he was a bit out of place. Less than two years, years later though, he receives his first superpower. In the month of April 1770, both his mother and his maternal great-grandfather died. Uh, Lafayette, was, Lafayette is now one of the richest, one of the wealthiest aristocrats in Europe and the hottest commodity on the, on the uh, marriage market. Uh, the, uh, so the Noel's family uh, goes after him. Because uh, the thing is, if you have daughters, you gotta provide them with dowries. Now here's this kid who's mega wealthy, okay? Doesn't have a lot of other connections, and so if you can make a deal, you don't have to give a big dowry because you got all this juice that you can give him to boost his career. Um, and before long, he's engaged to the, uh, to the, no, oh, back, back, I'm sorry. He's engaged to uh, the daughter of Jean-Paul Francois de Nola Blanc, Duc de uh, and, uh, I'm sorry, I just can't. I just can't do it. This is his, this is his uh, mother-in-law. Uh, you'll notice that she dies in 1794, uh, and she's a victim of the terror, along along with I think her sister and her her mother. I mean, she's a lot of uh, uh, go ahead. Adrienne's family uh, is uh, loses a lot to the terror. Adrienne uh, is spared uh, uh, because of. Uh, uh, Lafayette, the you know the Americans say to Robespierre, don't kill Lafayette's wife, please, you know. And, uh, so, 14-year-old uh, Lafayette moves to Versailles to live with his future future in-laws. At first, Adrienne does not know that they are engaged. 12-year 12-year-old Adrienne is just told to be nice to the orphan boy that her old man has taken an interest in. Now, so this is Lafayette's second superpower is now in play. He's part of the inner elite. He has potentially, at least, influence. He still doesn't fit in. He wants active military service, not the sort of ceremonial role that makes up court life. An odd thing about the education of the French elite was that they studied stories about Greek democracy in the Roman Republic while preparing to spend their lives catering to an absolute monarch. All those ideas swirling around make the stirrings of revolution in America of great interest. Uh, not to mention it creates a chance to stick it to the British who killed his old man. Uh, so these are, these are Lafayette's high school buds, okay? Uh, Louis XVI, Louis XVIII, 
uh, Charles X, um, and they'll all regret knowing him. Um, <laughs> so uh, Louis XVI and his father-in-law forbid Lafayette going to America. Don't do it. Uh, the French officers, it creates diplomatic problems in our war with England. I don't go, and the father-in-law is like, you're going to screw up your career. You know what's the matter with you? Oh, um, the Americans who recruited, recruited him can promise him the title of major general, but not much else, including any help actually getting to America. But remember, this is somebody with a superpower. Lafayette rounds up a dozen or so others who want to go on the adventure, and he buys his own ship to go to America. That's right, he, buy, he bought his own ship. In Philadelphia, Congress is getting fed up with many of the foreign officers who've been recruited who come demanding exorbitant salaries from an impecunious Congress. Lafayette can serve without salary, and people knowledgeable about the French court realize how influential he might be. Ultimately, he will be instrumental in the resources that France provides to the Americans. Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, so he ends up meeting, uh, meeting Washington and makes a good impression on him. Uh, go ahead. Uh, and he's, Washington's instructions are, be nice to the kid, make him feel important, try not to get him killed. Uh, but he's, uh, he ends up performing quite well at the, at the Battle of Brandywine, rallying, rallying the troops, and Washington depends to, uh, uh, starts getting him, um, starts using him. Uh, and in a mild but memorable display of his superpower, when he held, when he led a light infantry division, he didn't just command it, he equipped it. He helped uh, buying swords for all the NCOs. Uh, okay, let's, uh, <laughs> so, uh, go, uh, let's see. So, France ends up, uh, uh, France ends up agreeing to uh, back the America, recognize the America, agrees to back them, go ahead. And we have, the, we have the victory at Yorktown, which Lafayette is very instrumental in. And that really, seals his reputation as a superhero to Americans. He, he, he visits America briefly in 1784, but then he's gone. And what's going on with him is, is, is you know, there's reports about him being involved in the French Revolution and being in Dungeon and all that stuff. They, they, they follow his story, uh, but he's not, he's not involved in American politics and he's not associated with any region of the country. So in some cases, he's like the All-American, <laughs> unlike any of the other founding fathers. Uh, um, so that's what makes Lafayette a superhero. That's why he's received in that way. Uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna move along just a bit here. Uh, go ahead, Abby, let's see. Uh, French, right, French Revolution, Declaration of the Rights of Man, uh, the, dun the, the, dungeon, the dungeon experience. Uh, so, uh, an important feature of Lafayette's visit is that the 1824 election was going on, and it was extremely divisive. But then everybody could get together and cheer and cheer and cheer Lafayette, so it created this positive feeling. Plus, it, uh, the newspapers had to follow the story. They only had so many column inches, so there was less nasty political stuff that they could they could put in. Uh, the candidates: are John Quincy Adams, uh, Andrew Jackson, Henry Clay, John C. Calhoun, and William H. Crawford. I can never remember him. Uh, at any rate, I think I think you all know how the election turns out. It uh, has to go. It has to go to the House of Representatives. Uh, uh, Clay throws his support to Adams. Adams uh, agrees to make Clay the Secretary of State, and the Jet the Jacksonians are saying this is a corrupt bargain. And there's actually all these emanations going on that there might be 
some sort of violence, some, so, some, some sort of coup. And uh, uh, go ahead. Uh, Lafayette's secretary uh, wrote uh, the book that uh, Alan Hopkins translated. Uh, and one of, his, one of his comments was that he had um, heard this from the Jacksonians and then after, after, the, after everything was resolved, nothing happened. And so he talked to some of them, and uh, this is the answer he got. We were indeed very busy shouting, but our adversaries did not take account of it, and they were right. They have judged us better than, than we would have wanted them to. Now that the law has spoken, we have only to obey it. We will second Adams with the same zeal as if we had supported him. But at the same time, we will shine a light on his administration. And according to whether it will be good or bad, we will, we will defend it or attack it. Four years are passed very soon, and the consequences of the bad election are very easy to repair. Yes, I said to him, easier than the consequences of legitimacy or heredity. They left me while laughing, and on the following day, no one spoke of the election anymore. So that was possibly a gift from Lafayette uh, in the, from the farewell to Arnie's universal popularity. Uh, I'll take questions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I was tempted to have Evie and say, I was tempted to say that Evie should just show show you pictures of New uh, pictures of New York. Uh, but <laughs> but anyway, thank you very much. Uh, I appreciate it. <laughs> Five to seven. It's now seven o'clock, and uh, uh, I want to thank you all for coming. And I hope you enjoyed yourself here and throughout the whole day when Lafayette returned to New Hampshire. After two years. Yeah. And when does he return to New Hampshire? Uh, June next year. Yes. He was asked to come back to Massachusetts again for the dedication of the beginning of uh, Bunker Hill Memorial Building. And after that, he came up to New Hampshire. And, um, and it was a very funny story because uh, the New Hampshire coachman had told all of his friends that he was going to be driving Lafayette. And he came with a newspaper man from Concord and when they got down to pick him up in Massachusetts, the governor of, of Massachusetts said, oh no, he's not riding in any New Hampshire carriage. <laughs> <laughs> and so they drove back and all the way, people thought, oh, oh I forgot, there's an important moment here. Uh, they came across a veteran of the revolution, nobody knows who he was, but he was from Vermont, and he had come down to the Bunker Hill dedication. And his friends had gone off and left him and he didn't have a way home. So he asked these New Hampshiremen, could he have a ride to Concord? And they said, of course. But of course what happened is, everybody thought he was Lafayette. <laughs> <laughs> and they'd come up to a crossroads and it would be people throwing flowers and you know cheering and all that kind of thing. And, and uh, the New Hampshireman, whose name escaped me, uh, me too. would have to stand up at every crossroads and say, thank you so much. Thank you for coming out. 
this this is not Lafayette, but he will be along soon. And meanwhile, let's hear it for this veteran of the American Revolution. And he had to do it something on the order of 20 times. <laughs> 20 times. So anyway, and then he came to New Hampshire, and there was an amazing uh, party at the Capitol. There were 40,000 people who were in Concord. Wow. And, and at the time, the population of Concord was something like 3,000 people. And they said every empty lot was full of people, you know, camping out or whatever. And uh, it, was, it was an amazing event. And after that, he went to Maine, came back to New Hampshire again, and then he came to my town and your town, <laughs> and a bunch more. Yeah. So the bottom line is, from June 22nd to June 28th, with a day, from June 21st to June 28th, he visited about 15 or 16 towns mm -hmm. in New Hampshire. Wow. So we're gonna try to duplicate, you know, yes. 200 years ago, we'll try to do it again <laughs> next oh, yeah. June. Yeah. There's an app for that. Pardon? There's an app for that. There's an app for that. Oh, yeah. There's an app for that. We also did a, uh, an app called, uh, well, it's uh, Travel Stories. And if you can go on the app or you can just go on our two websites, uh, lafayette200.org and friendsoflafayette.org, and you can play 23 stories about his visits to each of the places in, in New Hampshire. There are four about Concord and three about Portsmouth, and then it's the rest of the town. So I want to finish Dee Dee's story. So the same author in his book says, and when he finally picked Lafayette up at the Methuen line and was able to take him onward yeah. to Salem, Derry, and Pembroke that night, he told Lafayette the story, and Lafayette was laughing. And he said, <laughs> I've got an idea. I'm getting kind of tired of all of these speeches. Why don't you do half of them and I do that? <laughs> <laughs> yes, Joe. Sure. And that's my question. Which of the two Lafayettes is coming next year? There's four Lafayettes. There are four. <laughs> well, I don't want to give short shrift to any of my comrades in arms. <laughs> George, since you have been exposed to both of them, you were at Bunker Hill and the parade. Uh, yes. Um, you can see how good they each are. So we were we were fortunate to get either one of them. Absolutely. But you're the best. I'm really just a Revolutionary War veteran from Vermont. I'm really <laughs> <laughs> He just he just sealed the deal. Yeah. Privileged to have either of these two. Oh, they're, they're both great. Mm -hmm. well, thank you very they're much. They're different, but they're great. <laughs> <laughs> but this is the concert. He doesn't return to Portsmouth. He does not return to Portsmouth. He sort of skirts it. He goes to Dover and into Maine, but he does not come back to Portsmouth. You can come to Concord, Concord and see him. He's going to be there. Yeah. Or Hopkinton. It's not that far. It's not that far. You know, she lives in Connecticut. And, you know, when I tell her, well, you ought to drive from here to here, she says, that's 45 minutes. I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> we Granite Staters are not afraid of driving an hour. Because <laughs> 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 we could be anywhere in an hour. We always have to cross the mountains. She says they don't cross rivers in Connecticut. <laughs> 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 so anyhow, it's been fun, and we're happy to have you, and glad you came. And Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.